if anyone's rolling a ball uphill, it's these guys. And they've done it. Um, now, just as a coincidence, our last guest speaker, last time we had an internet town hall, we brought in this woman. She's an internet activist. Now, she mentioned that her grandfather had got a, an honorary degree from, from uh, St. of X for co-op, who's worked with co-ops in Ontario. He's famous for being involved in all kinds of co-ops, and Ontario was the place for co-ops, along with Quebec and Saskatchewan. And that uh, Huron uh, uh, telephone company I mentioned is one of those co-ops dating back from this era. And so there's still a lot of places in Ontario where, where people own their telephone system or their water system and what have you. And so I just made, I mentioned there's a connection. She's, 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 uh, she's the granddaughter of him and she lives on his ideals that, that, that communities can, can have some say in their internet. Now when we get to Sambro, um, for various reasons, it might be better to look at uh, what we've been trying in the city out in a rural area because one of the disadvantages with, with Wi-Fi, particularly if it's unlicensed, the unlicensed ban, you're in the area where anyone can do Wi-Fi, is that you know, it all overlaps in the city as everyone gets in there. There's no, it's not licensed, there's no limitations. On, you, you, know, you don't have an exclusive right to it. But in rural areas where houses are spread out, they often have hills, they have fewer things that, that kind of interfere with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi actually makes sense. And you see the province is putting Wi-Fi into rural areas. There's been a lot of problems, but I'm, I'm convinced that it was probably the right thing to do, at least at a budget, once they work it out, that Wi-Fi does make sense in rural areas. I'm not personally, I'm not speaking to Chabak, so that Wi-Fi will work that well in, in the cities, at least in the unlicensed bands. Um, but it, it doesn't have to, it's not very hard to do. You've got ham operators out there or guys who, who operate CBs, they could probably do a good job in many areas. Very cheap and, and, and really fast speeds. Now, I was struck by the fact that Spryfield has a sort of an image problem, and I can't figure out why. It is a working class area. It has beautiful scenery around it. There's a lot of communities like that. The working class, they're not rich people. They have like beautiful scenery, but they don't have the bad rap that, that Spryfield does. And I've, I've, I've often wondered what, what you could do to change that image. We've tried and we've tried. Now, it struck me, Japan, when I was a kid, made in Japan was like a joke. But then it changed very dramatically in the 60s. But when I grew up, I learned it actually happened at the start of the Korean War. Uh, a famous American photographer was in Japan. Uh, a stringer, a, a nobody, a Japanese photographer, took a picture of him and gave him the photograph. He was so blown away by the quality. He said, where'd you get your lens? He said, oh, the guy in a garage is making them. He went over and he liked the lens, he put them on. Two weeks later, the Korean War started. He was the first on the scene, his pictures are very dramatic. He is the photographer of the Korean War. And everybody wanted, they were blown away by his pictures. He used a very small camera called a Leica, it's dark, it doesn't make much noise. Uh, it's great when you're on the front line as opposed to the great big 4x5 of the day where you're likely to get shot by a sniper. So he was out there where the pictures needed to be taken, pictures were wonderful. People asked, you know, what kind of a lens is it? Well, he said it was a Nikon, a Nikkor 51.2. This was the, f this lens was better than anything the German optics could make. And if you're old enough, you can remember when, even after the atomic bomb in World War II, us in North America always assumed the Germans had the best optics. When we heard that the Japanese made better optics, not just as good an optics as the, as, as the Germans, but better, we were blown away. From then on, people say, the image of Japanese and the ability of the Japanese to sell high quality products around the world changed overnight in a very short period of time. That lens and that coincidence that the war broke, which was at that time. Now, this guy must have heard that story because I can remember about 10 years ago, uh, July the 1st, uh, there was a Canada Day celebration on CBC. They had a little vignette of each province and territory. And it was beautiful. I loved it. I loved it. I, Quebec, I think the BC one and Quebec one the best. But anyway, Next day, there was these news stories that New Brunswick wasn't one of them. They had all the provinces, all the territories. They forgot New Brunswick. No one noticed except for the New Brunswickers. They could not, they could not get respect. I mean, they were like the Rodney Dangerfield. They just weren't different enough. Every, you know, so when McKenna came in, he he made some little token efforts in broadband and, and bringing in phone uh, call centers and everything. You know, if you look at it, what change it, it made, you have your questions whether it's really changed the technological basis of New Brunswick. 
But in terms of raising the self-confidence, I think you'll say the New Brunswickers are much more confident today as a result of that. And that's what he always said. He really thought that he, the, the real spin-off he wanted was to change the way people thought, not that they could get to the broadband, they could get to the broadband one year quicker than what they did in Ontario. He wanted to change their psyche. And I got to thinking, many people <coughs> told me Spryfield will be the last place to get, up, get fiber optics to the home. If, if Bedford will be first, they'll be the last. And I said, well, why don't we do something expected? Why don't, unexpected. Why don't we approach the government on this basis that they fund a small project of fiber to the home in the Spryfield area? Now, they'll, they'll learn about what fiber the optic to the home, the issues will be. But one of the spin-offs just might be envy from the rest of HRM, that maybe there's something in, in Spryfield, because they're getting fiber to the home instead of us. It could be something like this would help change the image of this area. And in terms of economics, Spryfield has a lower percentage of people who work in the area. It's a very much a bedroom community. And many people have said that they would like to have more local businesses in, the, in this area that their kids could, could go to work here and live in the community. And this would be, I mean, getting some fiber optics into Spryfield would be the start of changing that image if, in fact, it was seen as a bit of a high-tech area. Now, that Nova Scotia doesn't really do anything unexpected, but if we thought of that, this might be an idea. So I would say if I talked to Bill Estabrooks or, or, um, or Graham, Steele or Michelle, I'd say, look, why don't you think about putting it into this area instead of doing the expected and waiting till Alliant puts it into some upscale suburb in Bedford. I think it's Bedford, but let's try something a little bit different. All right, thanks for your <coughs>